The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about, when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because He was before me. Out of His fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. How you doing? Welcome to New River. We're so glad you're here. Again, if it's your first time, second time, third time, or if you've been here for 20 years, uh, it's an honor to have you uh, today. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts 2, uh, 42 through 47, so the last half of Acts. Uh, Emily already stole my message, so um, we might could just pray and be done, but uh, she probably did it better than me, too. She's awesome. Uh, I love her. Anybody excited about Thanksgiving? Yeah, uh, I, saw, I saw something on, uh, like a meme on Facebook that said, uh, bring up politics this Thanksgiving to save on Christmas presents. Uh, <laughs> don't actually do that. That's a bad idea. But man, I feel like I got saved last week, man. I, Chola started praying and I was like, Lord, can you just check, check the book of life and just make sure my name is still there because, uh, you know, I felt like I need to run up to the altar and just get saved. It's awesome. So uh, Acts, Acts chapter 2, the latter half, we'll get to that uh, in a second. Uh, I, I grew up, I loved, one of my favorite things as a kid growing up was going to Six Flags and Hurricane Harbor. Anybody love, you know, going to theme parks, whatever? Um, I loved uh, the black hole, at Hurricane Harbor, the big black, like spindly slide, right? Um, now, if you've spent any amount of time going to Six Flags, Hurricane Harbor, any kind of theme park, amusement park uh, like that, uh, especially when you're a kid, the expectation is, I'm going to go, I'm going to ride, like, you know, the slides all day, I'm going to ride the Titan, the black hole. Uh, but when you actually go back and analyze your time spent, what did you actually spend the majority of your time doing? Waiting in line, right? Like especially if it's peak season, uh, you're, you're like, you want to ride the Titan? It's okay, okay two-hour wait, uh, and then you'll have that, like, five minutes of glory riding the ride, and the rest of the time is standing with a bunch of sweaty, slightly angry, frustrated people uh, for most of your day. So you're not actually spending the majority of your time riding a ride. You're spending uh, your, the most of your time in the middle of a line. Um, this is kind of similar. I took Madison uh, to the chiropractor like a week or two ago. And listen, I love you. If you work in chiropractic, you know, whatever. God bless you. Uh, I love you so much. Um, because Madison loves the chiropractor. She like, she's like, that's my life. But I went, right, and I, I, I sat in the waiting room with her for an hour, okay? And uh, one hour. And then, and then she gets in front of the chiropractor, and he's like, wah, choo, wah, choo. all right, that's $100. It's like 20 seconds of actual chiropractic adjustment uh, for one hour waiting in the waiting room. Like, I spent so much time uh, waiting. I think, you know, it's funny. I, I thought of a third example this week. Uh, track meets. Anybody have any kids in track? Okay. You go to a track meet, right? It's, it's 175 degrees outside, you know, in the summer. And, and, and your kid is running, like, one race, and, and you sit in those stands for like five hours in the blazing heat, and then you cheer for your kid as loud as you can for 30 seconds, and then it's over. It's the same thing with like a swim meet, right? So the majority of your time is not spent actually cheering and excited. The majority of your time is spent just sitting in the stands, sweating, waiting for it to be over, right? Anybody ever experienced that at track meet? Yeah? Glad I'm not the only one. Uh, where... Some of you are like, where are you going with this, pastor? So my point is this, okay? Uh, you have 168 hours in your week. That's total hours. Um, and let's just say, I, I wanted to do some calculations. Let's say that you spend two hours at church every week, because we all attend church every single week. We never missed. Um, and we all serve, and we're all a part of the men's ministry, the women's ministry, student ministry. We're serving in that capacity, right? So let's say we spend... Two hours at church on uh, Sunday morning every, every week. And we also spend two hours at other activities and things 
uh, throughout the week. Okay, when I did the math, uh, or rather when Google did the math for me, um, that came out to 3.57% of your actual hours during your week. And, and if we adjust that for sleep, it's about 5 to 6% of your week that you spend actually at formal church activities. And for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the presence of God. We've been encountering the presence of God. Like I, I, again, I've been enjoying and just drinking in what God's been doing in our church in the last few weeks. But the reality that the Lord was stirring in me is what about the 94%? What about the rest of our lives, and especially as church leaders, we wanna make the 6% awesome, we wanna draw people in, we want people to encounter the Lord, we're asking for God to just break through with power, but the bottom line is 94% of your life will be spent doing ordinary, mundane tasks, washing dishes, doing laundry, picking the kids up, going to work, going to meetings. That's the 94% of our lives. And so the last thing I wanna do is get up here on the platform and restrict God's presence to just kind of like these big breakthrough moments when we meet together. What's the 94%? Because we want God to break through on Sunday mornings. We pray for that. We've got intercessory teams walking around. They're like anointing the chairs with oil. If they smell a little funky, that's probably why. Like they're praying for, for us to have an encounter with God this morning. But then on Monday morning, how do we get up, love our kids as we pack their lunch, and you know, go from cubicle to cubicle and meeting to meeting, and then we come home exhausted. How do we form flourishing relationships? We need to learn to find the presence of God, not just in these times, but in those times as well. And so, you know, I, I found um, through the course of time that, that some of our most important moments of connection with God happen like in the DMV. Like the, the worst place on planet earth, which is the DMV. Like there's no place worse. Everybody's angry and it smells weird. And like, what, what do you mean I have to have a birth certificate to get a driver's license for my daughter? What are you talking about? Like everybody's fighting with the clerks, whatever. And, and, or, or like you're walking through Costco and you don't need an industrial sized pallet of hand sanitizer. You just need like a bag of grapes and you can't find where the grapes are. Or um, I was thinking this week, I had to go to Home Depot. Some of you are really good at Home Depoting. I am not, okay? I walk in there, I feel lost. I ask one of the, and here's what happens. I ask, you know, Robert, who's wearing the orange vest, and I ask, hey, can you help me find where this valve is? And I kid you not, this happens to me every time. He looks at me like, are you serious? It's, you just go over there. This, and then this is, this is the instructions. That, go over there and take a left. When I go over there and take a left, there's still 900 aisles, okay? Like there's still a million things, right? But those are the moments where we have to learn to connect with the presence of God. The mundane, the ordinary, the 94%. It's not, this, today is not like a really different message. It's not maybe as intense as the last week's, but I feel from the Lord that it's essential if we're going to take what the Lord has deposited in the last week's and actually see fruit come of it in our lives. So here's my, my contention this morning. If we're going to be people of God's presence, Joey and I have been just hearing this word presence people, not just people who talk about the presence of God, people who are like submerged in God and every day we go out and represent him to the world and people can see his love and his goodness. If we wanna be those kind of people, we have to learn to find God's presence in the middle. Sunday, Sunday, mountaintop experience, mountaintop experience, worship night, worship night. We have to find God's presence in the middle. And so the title of my message today is The Radical Middle. The Radical uh, Middle. Because as I, as I see it in, in my own experience, uh, albeit limited, is that there's two principal lies that are sold to us about the Christian life, typically from within the church, Okay. And if I can, I'm going to extend my water slide analogy back to, I don't know why I was obsessed with water parks this week, but I was. Um, so I'm going to extend that analogy. The first lie that is sold to us about the Christian life is that the Christian life is just the endless water slide. You don't ever have to wait in line. There's no entry fee. There's no cost. There's no suffering. There's no pain. Congratulations. You asked Jesus into your heart. Now it's fairies and, and gold dust all day, every day. 
Like, if you have enough faith, you'll probably get a few yachts and maybe a private jet. Like, you're, you're never going to struggle with anxiety. Everything will be perfect, right? Because that's what Jesus said the Christian life was like. That is, that is not the Christian life. That is not the gospel. In fact, Jesus said uh, in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. How do we get this so missed? How do we miss this? Jesus, who never speaks any errant words, says you will have trouble in this life. Not you might have trouble. Not if you have enough faith, you can escape trouble. No, you will encounter trouble in this life. You will encounter pain in this life. But what does he say? Take heart, I've overcome the world. So the first lie is just that once you accept Jesus into your life, everything's gonna be rosy and awesome all the time. And, and the second lie is the opposite extreme. The Christian life is about sickness and poverty. Like the poorer, the more miserable you are, the better you're doing the Christian life. You meet those people, how you doing? I'm just suffering until he comes to take me to glory. You know, like, why? okay. Like, and, and so that's our message to the world. Come suffer and be miserable. It's awesome. So the second lie is just that the Christian life is only waiting in line. You'll get to the water slide in heaven, but there's no miracles now. There's no healing. There's no breakthrough. You know, all that stuff just kind of died with the apostles. And now we just struggle as hard as we can trying to make it through until Jesus sucks us out of here. So what did Jesus say in the same book, John 10, 10? The thief comes only to still kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Many translations say, and have it abundantly. This is the same gospel, the gospel of John. I just read you two verses from the gospel of John where Jesus says, in this life you will have trouble and in this life you will have abundant life. We see a contradiction, but the truth is right in the middle. Like the truth is we have abundant life, but we're gonna go through stuff. Like we're gonna go through stuff, but we're also gonna experience breakthrough moments with God. Like you're gonna experience miracles. I believe we're gonna experience more and more miracles and signs and wonders in this place than you could ever imagine. But no matter how much breakthrough we see, we are still going to live most of our life in between those two realities. In between suffering and pain that we will go through and those mountaintop experiences where it's just like ecstasy and you just see the face of God and you feel his love and his goodness. Like I love those. And I, I want to see more of those moments. But most of our life is in the middle. Look at Isaiah 43 too. What does Isaiah say? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. This text does not say, good news, no rivers, no fires, no water. You're not going to pass through anything. It's just going to be a perfect, blissful life every single day. That's not the promise. God's promise is not a life free from difficulty. His promise is to be present with us in our difficulty. Not the absence of pain. It's his presence within pain. We have to learn to cultivate an awareness of that in the middle. In the middle of the valleys and the mountains. Because here, I'll put it this way. The majority of our time is not spent on mountains or in valleys. The majority of our time is spent at sea level. And if anybody tells you that the Christian life is just valleys or just mountains, it's not true. It's right in the middle. You're just at sea level. You're doing tasks. You're like sharpening pencils if you're, you know, in school or whatever. Like, you're spending your time doing things that possibly from the pulpit have been preached to you as being irrelevant and unimportant. If you really want to serve God, you got to go into the ministry. You got to become a preacher or like a worship. Like, those, these visible gifts are not in any way more important than being an entrepreneur in Hudson Oaks or Weatherford or Lido. Like your job is to be faithful and to encounter and carry the presence of God in the middle of your week, in the middle of seemingly unimportant tasks. 
come on, I got somebody with me. <laughs> so where's God's presence in the 94% for you, for your life this week? And I want to just go, I want to go to Acts, Acts two, the beginning of Acts 2, um, which I probably preach from nine times a year. Uh, <laughs> but here it is again for you. The day of Pentecost. So here, here's what happens. This is one of the biggest moments in the history of the church. Here's what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I read this and I'm like, sign me up. Like, there's fire and wind blowing. Like, this is an incredible encounter with God. This is a big mountaintop experience uh, that all of the people gathered in that upper room are experiencing right now. I want to see that. I hope for it. I pray for it. I'm on my knees asking for it. But then look, Acts, Acts 4.31. I want to I show you this. Look at Acts 4.31. Two chapters later. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. There it is again, another big, like incredible encounter with God. That's like the, the little earthquake. So we have fire, wind, earthquakes. Like how many would sign up for like some of that in your life? Like that would be pretty incredible if God just like, you're like, God, am I in your will? And your room just starts shaking, like <laughs> pushing forward. Gonna open that business. You know, like that would be amazing. So here we have two big mountaintop experiences. But here's what I want to take you to. I'm not going to go through either one of those texts today. I'm going to take you right in the middle of those two texts. So go to Acts 2.42. See, our, our version, I put our version up here. Our version of what would happen after the day of Pentecost is this. After amazing day of Pentecost, they departed from Jerusalem and said, See you next week back at the upper room at 5 p.m. Then they all went back to normal life, eagerly awaiting the next big meeting where God would show up. <laughs> Invite a friend to church next week and try to make it through your week because, you know, God's not going to move until we get back to the upper room next week at 5 p.m. And the band's there and Peter's got his sermon prepared. No, like what happens actually in the middle of Acts 2-4 and Acts 4-31? What's this? I'll start reading in verse 42, Acts 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So here's my point. In between Acts 2-4, tongues of fire, wind blowing, filled with the Holy Spirit, and Acts 4-31, another big, earth shaking, filled with the Holy Spirit, going out speaking with boldness. In between those two big moments, they developed a rhythm of life that would sustain them in between those big encounters. You cannot live your life trying to jump from high to high and experience to experience and feeling to feeling. You will not, you will burn out. You will not make it for the long haul. And what God is looking for is not people who will burn bright and burn up, but people who will burn steady for a long period of time. And what God is setting us up for in this, in this passage is, yes, we love Acts 2-4. We're going after it. Yes, we love Acts 4-31, earth-shaking, filled with the Spirit. But here are the rhythms of life that you can live out in the 94% as you are working at your job, taking care of your kids, trying to love your spouse well, all of those ordinary things that seem to be not important, that's actually where you develop the steadiness with God, where you experience 
his presence and hear his voice most clearly. And that is the time that will sustain you for long periods of time. They developed a rhythm of life at sea level as they struggled through valleys and contended for mountaintop breakthroughs. And so I want to point out something, though, in the grammar. This is, we're about to go to class for a second, but, but this is really important. I promise you this is really important. Uh, in, in the original language, uh, Greek is the original language of the New Testament. And, and in the original language, there's two past tenses. It's a little strange for us who are in English. If you speak Spanish, you know about these two, two past tenses. But in Greek, there is a tense called the imperfect tense and a tense called the aorist tense. Okay, so the aorist tense is when something happened one time. It just happened. Like so-and-so met so-and-so. They just met once in a moment. It never happened again, okay? So there are certain times in the New Testament where this tense is used. And you know, it, that thing happened once in the past, and that was it. And then the imperfect tense references actions in the past that were ongoing for a long period of time. They weren't just one thing and then it was done. It was an ongoing, habitual, day-to-day -day process. Why am I talking about this? Every verb from Acts 4, uh, 242 to 247 is in the imperfect tense. So what does that mean? When it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, when it says they were together, when it says they sold, when it says they continued to meet together and broke bread, that wasn't a one-time, it wasn't an occasional, it wasn't an on-again, off-again thing. This was a steady, consistent lifestyle that they lived. They lived in the imperfect tense. You know, anybody ever met some of those people who are in, I'd call it a fire and ice relationship, right? Like hot and cold. Like when they're together, it's like PDA all the time and they're just kissing on each other, loving on each other. They're commenting on each other's social media even though they're in the same room. Like, I love you, boo. No, I love you, pookie. Like, you know, it's, oh, it's just nasty and, you know, you're great, whatever. And then when they fight, they're like throwing toasters at each other, Right? It's like hot and cold. Some of you have been in a relationship like that. You're like, well, this is too real right now. Like, <laughs> it's like hot and cold. Like, either they're really in or they're really not in. And see, that's the, that's the kind of relationship that you'll see in every Hollywood movie, right? Because it's exciting to watch people throw toasters at each other when they're fighting, right? But then you meet people who have been married for 50, 60 years, 70 years, and they're like, you know, true love to me is when my husband helps me clean my dentures. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being for real, right? Because that's what steadiness looks like. Steadiness looks like we love each other by, you know, cleaning the dentures and taking out the trash and like all of those little things. And the problem is steadiness is like not sexy enough or something in our culture. We don't value steadiness. We don't value consistency. We value people who shoot up to the top and shine really brightly. And then we, we kind of, you know, feel bad for them as they burn up and fall away. It's a celebrity culture. We, we, we fuel the fire as people rise to the top, and then we just watch as they, you know, evaporate in an instant. Oh, it's too bad for them. They burned up. Oh, it's too bad for them. The money got the best of them, right? Like, we don't, as a culture, value steadiness. And first of all, let me just say, I love those of you in this room who have incredible testimonies of how the Lord's brought you from incredible, like, drug addiction and all sorts of incredible scenarios. I love that. But I want to let you know in this room, if you're that person where, like, you've just been attending church faithfully for 50 years, your story is valuable yeah. and needed. Yeah. And I know that all those are, are, are amening, even the people with the big stories, because they say, I wish that my life would have just been lived steady, knowing the Lord, living for the Lord, without the consequences of some of those things. And you're thankful for your story, but listen, what we need is steadiness. We need consistency in the church. That's what presence ultimately looks like. It's not just the big things like we had last week, but the steady process of knowing the Lord. So, so in those relationships, though, what starts to mean the most is not the fact that you share big moments. It's the fact that you share every moment. So I'll put it this way to, to kind of do the culmination of my grammatical exercise. Life 
in the radical middle is life in the imperfect tense. Some of us, we do these things, but we do them in the aorist tense. We do them once, we do them occasionally, we'll occasionally break bread, we'll occasionally devote ourselves to scripture, we'll occasionally devote ourselves to prayer. But listen, they were doing these things. When you see this tiny block of text, this tiny block of text is the key to unlocking the entire book of Acts. Because what you don't know is in every big story that's contained, the one factor that never changed was Acts 2:42 through 47. They never stopped. And I, I want to point out, you remember on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved? That's amazing. I want to see like one meeting where 3,000 people are saved. Isn't that awesome, right? But then at the end of this passage, it says, they added to their number daily. So that was like three people, four people, seven people, one person, three people. But they, they didn't get disappointed. And be like, it's not 3,000. We're failing. No, they found the consistency of, I'm going to talk to one person today. I'm gonna to talk to two people. I'm gonna find the person at HEB today. I'm gonna to, uh, find the person over here and I'm gonna to talk to them. And I'm just gonna go for that daily witness, that daily word for somebody, that daily encouragement for somebody. That was the rhythm that they were in. So here's how they did it. I just wanna give you a couple of practical things. I hope this message is, is a little bit more practical because we really need to take that, that thing of, again, we, we talked in week one about what's your one thing, just pursuing the presence of God, making his presence uh, the defining uh, drive and motivation of our hearts, right? In the second week, we talked about, I want it my way. We talked about uh, David and the ark. And then last week, we talked about, uh, what did we talk about? Well, we, yeah, we talked about the ark again. We finished the ark with David and Michael. Gosh, it's been a long week, man. We talked about looking at life through windows, right? And I hope that all those things impacted you. I hope that you're gonna carry some of that with you. But all of that is summed up in the daily things that these people did to live their lives out for the gospel, okay? So what did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So that's applicable in your life by reading scripture. The way that you and I devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching is we read the Bible, we become possessed by being people of this book. And, and that's not like, you're like, oh, I thought you were preaching about the presence of God. Yes, I am. The key for you to live a life of sustained encounter with God is that you are completely absorbed day in and day out in his word. Scripture is, is the fuel that will keep you burning. You will burn out and you will live apathetic and dry if you do not have fuel from scripture. And when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, again, when you hear us use the term apostolic, we're talking about a different kind, a different level of gifting. No one who walks around today is an apostle in the sense of the New Testament. Not one person, okay? We, we, we love the gift, and that gift has a lot to do with planting churches. It has a lot to do with seeing the power of God move all over the earth. But I just want to make it clear that when it says devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, we're not talking about somebody who's walking around calling themselves an apostle. We're talking about scripture. The people who wrote this down, that's what we're devoting ourselves to. And listen, if I have to say it 200 times, I will. The power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God are not in contradiction. We as a church culture, particularly since the Reformation, have created a lie that says if you pursue the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you hate the Bible, and if you love the Bible, you hate the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's not true, and it's a lie that comes straight from the pit of hell to keep us bickering and fighting with each other instead of walking in spirit and truth. Listen, I, this is one of the core messages of my heart, and I won't stop proclaiming it. So when you hear from this pulpit, whatever we say, whatever leadership comes and, and releases from this point, I want you to know that we do that because we feel compelled by the weight of the word of God. When we talk about prophecy or the prophetic, we do so because we're commanded to do so in 1 Corinthians 14.1. If we talk about, oh my gosh, they talked about tongues or they talked about a prayer language, well, we're commanded not to forbid that in 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Okay, well, why are you guys talking about healing and signs and wonders so much? Because we're commanded to heal the sick in Luke chapter 10. And in Mark 16, it says signs and wonders will follow, follow those who believe. And in James chapter five, the elders are commanded to uh, pray over those who are sick. And, and in Acts 4, uh, 27, it says that signs and wonders were gonna break out in the name of Jesus. Like we do these things because we love the word of God. 
not because we're pursuing some weird thing, not but because we wanna be an edgy church, not because we just wanna be uh, like charismatic or join some kind of movement that's happening. We are compelled, we are under the weight of scripture to pursue the fullness of the Holy Spirit and to walk in truth. And listen, some of you are like me and, and you're an intellectually kind of minded, you, fit, you get in your head a lot and I wanna just call you deeper out of your comfort zone. Some of you are just like, yeah, I love that, it's great, but I've never really read more than five verses of the Bible. Okay, well, I'm calling you up too. I wanna call both of these groups together because sometimes I've walked through my life feeling like I'm an alien. Oh, you mean like, like I wanna come in and just encounter the Holy Spirit. I wanna walk in all of his gifts and then I just wanna go lock myself in my office and read a 1200 page Greek commentary. Like, I, and so I felt like, is there anybody who's with me who wants to like bring these things together, fuse these things, not just look, look for weird stuff just because it's weird and cool and not just lock ourselves in this cage of like, the Bible means that there's not any miracles and it all died with the apostles. Listen, spirit and truth. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And then, what does it say next? To fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So we devote ourselves to scripture and we devote ourselves to family. Spiritual family and your physical family. Breaking of bread, fellowship in your house. Like, in the next couple of weeks, just invite some people over for a dinner party. Talk about sports. You know, talk about whatever it is that you talk about. And then just devote 20 to 30 minutes to just celebrating what God's doing in your life. It's not like a deep revelation, but my point is, that's church. Like, that's the 94, that's the radical middle. It's not just the ordinary, like, oh, I'm just going to live, and when I come to church, I'm going to get in my Jesus mode. Like, no. Like, just have some people over and eat together and just, just rejoice in what God's doing. That's what they're doing here. That's how they're living their life in the 94%. Develop your physical and spiritual family. What's the third? Prayer. Oh, yeah, it's cliche. Obviously, the pastors always get up and tell us to pray. It's not that easy. I always get distracted. I start thinking about college football, and I look at the stats on my phone, right? Like, prayer is the most talked about and yet, like, the least practiced discipline. It's just true. And it's because, let me give you a theory, at least. This is one reason. It's because we're told constantly to go after the two hours instead of the five minutes. And how many of you get caught in that cycle of condemnation where you tried to pray for two hours and then you prayed for like an hour and 15 minutes and the devil's like, failure. You just spend an hour and 15 minutes of your day like in God's presence communicating with him and all of a sudden you feel condemned. Listen, that's because there's been a yoke of legalism placed on you that is not from the Lord. So what I want you to go after in the, in the radical middle, in the 94% of your life, is try to find, I call them anchor points. Three, four, five minutes during the day, in between meetings, as you're going in the car to pick up the kids, find those moments in between tasks and connect with God. Just begin, I'll just begin to start like, like telling him who he is. This is one of the things that I do. Again, I'm trying to be really practical. I just start saying the names of God. You can even look this up on Google, names of God. I'm just like, Almighty, you know, Almighty Father, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor. I just begin to tell him who, and all of a sudden, my heart begins to shift. And so whenever I go into that next task, whenever I go into that meeting, my heart is anchored in him, and I'm not gonna be swayed by the stress of what could, what could come my way in whatever task I'm going into. You with me? I'm trying to be, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to just make sure that this whole sermon series is not just fireworks, Okay, that it's, it, it sets you up, sets us up as a community for longevity in the weeks and months that follow. Because the reason why the apostles were sustained, listen, they went through incredible persecution. And they did not give in because they had this rhythm of life where they connected with God. So we go for prayer and we, listen, eliminate distractions. Just get in a place where you're not distracted. Luke 5, 16. Jesus often did what? Withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I don't have time to get into this. It's a whole other rant. But the problem is there's almost no lonely places on planet Earth when you carry a phone with you. 
So you need to figure out what it looks like in your life. Nobody, I, I'm not the Holy Spirit, so I can't tell you what your technological guidelines should be in your family. But what I can tell you is that you need to find a pattern of being able to withdraw and get to a lonely place. That could be locking yourself in the facilities closet at your job. Like, I, I don't know what it is. Find a lonely place, eliminate distractions, leave your phone at your desk, whatever it takes. Like Madison and I, this, again, this is just us, okay? I, I am not putting anything on you. We actually just decided we're gonna move our TV out of our main room. So we just got rid of it. And all of a sudden we just sit in our main room. We're like, oh, I don't, I don't even wanna turn the TV on. But we just turned it on because it was in there. And all of a sudden we find ourselves connecting, spiritually going deeper at a deeper level, just because we found a way in our own personal life to eliminate some of the things that were distracting us from a lifestyle of prayer. So go for those anchor points and eliminate distractions. So, so scripture, family, prayer, and then what's the last one? Generosity. And, and as we're coming into the Christmas season, how many of you know there's a lot of needs in our community? And I loved watching us just wipe the angel trees out. We just destroyed, they didn't have any left. We're like, can we have more? They're like, we don't have any more for you. We're like, <sighs> but listen, you don't need an angel tree. Find a need, meet the need. Identify a need from someone around you and find a way to do the radical middle in between the service. We're not providing anything for you. You just found the need like they did in this passage and you met it and nobody was in need. Generosity. So Jesus is the Lord of the mundane and the miraculous. And right there in the middle, in your day-to-day Minute to minute, hour to hour life is where he wants to move consistently, where he wants you to become more aware of his presence. Are you with me? Like, I know this is, not, this is not as flashy, but like it, the Christian life is not about struggling through, uh, barely making it. No, it's just taking advantage of every moment to cultivate an awareness of his presence. So how can we structure our lives and leverage our gifts and our resources to create that awareness of how God is moving in the 94%, in the middle, in the mundane, in the ordinary. We're entering a season of busyness and distraction and family tension. So what we need more than ever is just to cultivate a rhythm, a consistent, steady rhythm of practice that will help anchor us and keep us from getting swept up in all of the stuff that's coming our way as we enter into the holiday season. That's the radical middle. And I want to just tell you a little story as I close. Um, I could get the keys up here. That'd be awesome. Um, in, In the 17th century, there was a French monk and his name was Brother Lawrence. And There is absolutely no practical reason why I should even know who Brother Lawrence is. Uh, In the scheme of history, okay, and I say this with all love to to good old bro Lawrence, um, he is one of the least important people who has ever lived. What do I mean mean by that? He was not a king. He was not even a priest. Like, he's just this monk who lived in a monastery and washed dishes all of his life. That's all he did, and yet I know his name. Because one of the other priests one day was visiting the monastery, and he walked into the kitchen, and he saw a bunch of people standing around watching Brother Lawrence wash wash dishes. And all of a sudden, he started to ask himself, why are there a bunch of people in the kitchen watching this guy wash dishes, right? And eventually, he started having conversations with Brother Lawrence. There's a beautiful book. You can get it. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Here's what Brother Lawrence uh, learned. Here was the theme of his life. All I have to do to be aware of the presence of God is find it within myself in every ordinary, mundane task as I'm washing the dishes to take a moment and center myself, think about him, his goodness, his love. And all of a sudden, 
Brother Lawrence would become so aware of God's presence, he would just be smiling and singing and laughing all day while he washed dishes, so much so that people wanted to come into the kitchen because the kitchen felt different. Like, people will want to come to your cubicle and just stand there because it feels different when you come up with a way in your daily, ordinary life to connect yourself with God. In Acts chapter 3, it says, when they saw Peter and John, and they saw that they didn't have any training or education, they knew that they had been with Jesus. It was obvious and it was evident because of the way they lived their life. And so I love Brother Lawrence. I love that he learned how to practice the presence of God. And he would get better and better at just as he's washing dishes, as he just is centering himself, praying, worshiping, not every second of every day, like just talking to God, but no, just living a life that is oriented towards God. That's a life of prayer. That's a life of presence. And so he wrote a poem, and I love this poem. I'm gonna read it to you. It says, Lord of all the pots and pans and things, since I've no time to be a great saint by doing lovely things or watching late with thee or dreaming in the dawn light or storming heaven's gates, make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. Warm all the kitchen with thy love and light it with thy peace. Forgive me all my worrying and make my grumbling cease. Thou who didst love to give men food in room or by the sea, accept the service that I do, I do it unto thee. That is the radical middle. So I want you to stand this morning. How can we become like Brother Lawrence, where 300 years later, somebody is quoting something we wrote about washing dishes? Like he's remembered. And you know what I can tell you even more than that? Even if we didn't know his name, heaven knew his name. He was known in heaven because he was somebody who went after the presence of the Lord in every single moment of his life. So, Father, we just ask that you would help us. Lord, as as we contend for the big moments and the breakthroughs that you have for us as a church, Lord, and as we weather the storms and pass through the valley of the shadow of death, would you teach us, God, in those sea level moments when we're just living our daily life to find that rhythm of hearing your voice, feeling your love, and representing you to the people around us. Teach us how to become presence people. Teach us how to carry your love to the world in such a way that people would be able to note the distinct atmosphere that we carry in every place that our feet set, uh, uh, that our feet go, God. Teach us to live in the middle and to do it well. Lord, right now, would you just begin to reveal in people's hearts rhythms that they can begin to develop, ways that they can alter their schedule, ways that they can plan beforehand to include those tiny moments of connection that anchor us in your character and your nature and your goodness, your faithfulness. Lord, I just bless each and every person in this room that we would be known as a people of generosity, a people of fellowship and community, a people of prayer, a people who love your word, who are zealous for your word, who are passionate about digging deep into who you are. Lord, we need your help. We need your presence more than ever before. Just take a moment, take a few seconds as we close. Begin to think about Monday, begin to think about Tuesday, Wednesday. 
I want you to just see the shifts that God's bringing into your life, shifts that he's bringing into your schedule. Not radical five, 10 hour shifts, no, just tiny five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 seconds. And then I want you to just imagine for a second, just with a sanctified imagination, just imagine how the people around you are gonna be impacted for the gospel, for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So I bless you. Hope that you go in the power of the Spirit, the grace of God. Have an amazing week. Say hi to somebody, give them a hug. We'll see you soon.